knows that legumes fix nitrogen, but I want to let you in on a little known secret. Some of the native warm season grasses do too. Switchgrass is the one we're going to talk about today. So switchgrass has the ability to fix nitrogen. So the air is like 80 some percent nitrogen. We put on fertilizer on places because this nitrogen in the air is not available to the plants. So legumes have this ability to, they, they have this little bacteria that lives in a nodule, a little bump on the root. That bacteria that's living in that bump on the root, that nodule, takes nitrogen from the air that the plant can't access and it converts it into a form that the plant can use. Okay, so in exchange, the plant, the legume plant, gives that bacteria some food, gives it some sugars, the stuff that it's making in its leaves, the photosynthate, um, you know, the product of that photosynthesis, it gives to that microbe. Okay, so now the switchgrass, how does it happen? Because the legume, a lot of people know about how that happens, a lot of people have seen those nodules, but on the switchgrass, how does that happen? It's called an associative nitrogen fixation, is the big fancy word for for this type of nitrogen fixation. And the microorganisms, there's different types of them, but they don't live in a nodule or in a little bump on the root. They just live near the root. They also live in parts of the switchgrass plant. So in the root, in the stem, and there's a lot of research and a lot of learning being done ex on exactly how much nitrogen each of these parts are fixing. But let's just think of them down here in the roots, along the roots, and we've got that same trade going on. The switchgrass is giving photosynthate, giving those sugars, giving carbon, those are three different ways we can refer to it, to the microorganisms. The microorganisms have the ability to take that carbon, use it as a food source, take the nitrogen and convert it to a form that the plant can use and it gives it to the plant. So you've got this symbiotic relationship going on. The nitrogen fixation, that the ability to take the nitrogen that's in the air and convert it into a plant available form is very energy intensive. So it requires an effort on the plant's part to give it that energy. So it's kind of, I like to think of it like free fertilizer, free nitrogen fertilizer that this switchgrass plant, this is a switchgrass field I'm in here. This switchgrass plant gets this free nitrogen fertilizer from this, but it's not quite free because it does have to supply the energy to that microbe to get this. So it's not just one species of microbe that does this either. There's multiple species of microbes living along that root in the what we call the rhizosphere, the area around the root, uh, multiple species living inside the plant. And so it's multiple species that are doing this. So is it anything, this is neat and cool, is it anything very significant? It's a little hard to measure as I understand from reading some of the research, but I have found in the literature that maybe it's something like 45 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Um, now this switchgrass field here has not been fertilized at all. It's May 9th today and I've got switchgrass leaves that are, you know, if I stretch it out, gosh, it's almost up to my pocket knife. Um, even with them bent over, you know, they're getting up to knee high pretty easily and pretty reliably. So this is all without nitrogen fertilizer and that's because we've got a significant amount by some of the research of nitrogen fixation that's going on. So to give you a comparison, uh, what about our local fescue field? You know, how, how, or orchard grass, or you know, whatever introduced cool season grass you might have, what, what would we put on it? Well, since we're in the native grasses and we graze native plants here at our place, I don't actually know like what people put on a fescue field. So uh, old Google comes to the rescue and it looks like anywhere between, you know, 40, 120 pounds to the acre, uh, that 120 pounds, they were splitting into two different applications of nitrogen. So I don't really know what the current price of fertilizer is either because again, we have um, native warm season grasses and the native cool seasons too, but we're not putting on nitrogen fertilizer. We're not putting on fertilizers at all. So I'll Google to the rescue again. You know, it looks like maybe it's 50 cents a pound um, for that nitrogen. So if we just take 100 pounds to the acre, everybody's numbers are gonna be different, right? Depending on where you're at, what you like to do as far as fertility. But if we're putting on 100 pounds an acre times 50 cents, well, that's $50 an acre of cost. And so 
with the switchgrass here, basically we're getting, I guess, half that, 50 or nearly 50 pounds to the acre times 50 cents, so $25 an acre of fertilizer for free. So turns out to be a fairly big, um, you know, benefit that our switchgrass can give us to feed those microbes to make that nitrogen fixation happen. So talking about nitrogen fixation and nitrogen fertilizer too, what is the impact on the switchgrass and its fixation of nitrogen if we come in here and we do fertilize it? So the research seems to not be in total agreement, but it looks like, at least in part, there is a pretty big impact on nitrogen fertilizer and nitrogen fixation. And what happens is it, if you put on nitrogen fertilizer, there's no need for the nitrogen fixation anymore. And so that shuts down because that nitrogen fertilizer is so readily available that why bother to do this energy intensive process? So the plant has to give that microbe the food, super energy intensive to convert that nitrogen. So we have to give it a lot of food and super energy intensive. So if we have nitrogen fertilizer, why would we bother? So it looks like there's actually a detrimental effect on the, the natural system of getting nitrogen into this grassland. The one that is in here by design, that system that's in here by the design of the grassland, it looks like there's a detrimental impact of putting nitrogen fertilizer on switchgrass. And if you think about it, this makes sense because the nitrogen fixation is super energy intensive. It's the same thing when we make nitrogen fertilizer, it's super energy intensive. So this plant, the switchgrass, is having to give, uh, photo, give these sugars, give carbon to the microbe. So we've got this trade going on, but that's an energy drain on the switchgrass, right? It's using some of the energy, by no means is it using all of it. Here we are, not even the middle of May, and you know, we've got switchgrass plants that are approaching knee high. Um, not all of them are nearly that high, but some of the tips of the leaves would be actually higher than knee high. So we've got significant growth. It's been cool and damp the last few days, which does not, is not what a native warm season grass loves. Uh, they love warm and they want to get on with their photosynthesis, but they need warm temperatures and high light. Anyway, enough of that rabbit trail. We've got nitrogen fertilizer that comes in. If we do that, what is the incentive for that plant to give some of its sugars to those microbes? Well, there isn't one because it has this other source of nitrogen that has come into the system. So why bother to feed these microbes? Just say, sorry, sweetie, we're shutting off this relationship. And they quit for a while and then, you know, pick it back up later if they need to. But it really does seem to be that nitrogen fertilizer affects this relationship. I found it interesting that it looks like this fixation of nitrogen doesn't happen like, you know, at a certain level over time or even necessarily mirror when the plant needs it. It seems to happen in episodes. And so it's thought that what happens is there's a missing component, like there's not enough food for the microbes or there's not enough uh, nutrients for the microbes. Things like molybdenum, things like vanadium. Uh, so we don't, you know, vanadium especially, we don't talk about that in relation to plants, um, but also iron, phosphorus, some other elements. So maybe one of those is in short supply, or maybe there's not enough water. Life requires water, microbes are no different. And there's another part to the water story here in that a lot of the elements that these microbes need, so this molybdenum, the vanadium, phosphorus, iron, a bunch of the different elements have to be in a certain state and water affects that state. So if you have enough water, then the microbe, it's more, that element is often more available to the microbe and then that microbe can use it, even if it was there in abundance before. Water could be in two different things. One, it's just necessary for life, but two, it makes the nutrients that are needed more available. What has been seen in some of this research is that it does look like after a rainfall event, the nitrogen fixation happens more. Well, this makes sense from a lot of standpoints, right? One, we've got the, the switchgrass is happy. It's got water uh, and they have deep, deep roots so they can pull up a lot of water even in really dry times but who doesn't like to have some extra water when you're a plant? 
So the switchgrass has got water. It's got extra photosynthate then to share with the microbes that are living in the soil. You've got the nutrients that these microbes need in the correct form. So it's wet in that soil. The microbe itself has enough water. And so you've got kind of this really ideal situation. And that's like the, the thing that trips the trigger and makes the fixation of this nitrogen happen. So I thought that was really interesting. But then I also was reading further and one of the things that happens too is when the switchgrass grows up, gets tall, gets brown, and senesces is the big fancy word for it, but dies back. So the root system is still alive underground. Uh, the plant has shipped a lot of nutrients downstairs to that root system uh, because this vegetation that we see now that's so green and lush is going to turn brown and be consumed by fire, consumed by an herbivore, or just lay down and turn into mulch on the ground. It's not going to be used next year for that plant. So the plant ships a bunch of nutrients downstairs, and when it does that, then there's this, it, there seems to be this excess of, of carbon in the soil to feed these microbes. Why is this happening? Is it just that the roots can't fit any more into their roots, any more, you know, reserve of energy into the roots and so some leaks out. I don't even begin to want to guess what's happening there. But what I did find really interesting was that there's a big release of nitrogen at that time. And there's actually another video in which we talk about what the consequences are for a grassland when there's diversity out there because of this. Really is a beautiful system in my mind and how that happens. Of course one last thing that we need to mention when we're talking about nitrogen in the soil is just the fact that once it's incorporated into plant material, whether it's this switchgrass plant that takes that up and uses it, or whether it is, you know, a cool season grass that takes that up and uses it, that can be recycled into nitrogen for future microbes, future plants to use. Uh, basically, there's a recycling system that is set up out here in nature that is the, the dead plant material. So this switchgrass thatch from last year, these leaves and stems, is basically broken down by microbes and so then you know it's turned into unrecognizable stuff not like we can see that this is a leaf and this is a, a stem here and so but it's turned into unrecognizable stuff and in the process nutrients are released so things like nitrogen become available for plants to use for other microbes to use they're available in that soil ecosystem that soil food web so that's a really important part of the nitrogen cycle as well is the recycling of that. So when you've got a producer of nitrogen, like the switchgrass, it's not producing it itself, right? It's that symbiotic relationship, but that is then shared through that ecosystem, if that makes sense. I'm Elizabeth at Hamilton Native Outpost, where we really enjoy digging into grasslands and figuring out how they work, understanding the components of it. It's a real interest of ours, and we enjoy sharing that with you all. If you have interest in a native grassland, in planting one for your own purposes, whether that's switchgrass or whether that's a field of diversity, um, for whatever purposes that might be, whether it's wildlife and uh, rabbits, whether that's grazing and uh, you know having native forages out there, whatever your purposes might be, check out our website and watch our other videos.